Why asking donors for money causes donors to give less. An introduction to resource campaigning with Lindsay Walton. Hello, my name is Lindsay Walton. I'm a professional team builder, speaker and presenter, and author of Why Asking Donors for Money Causes Donors to Give Less. In the last 20 years, I've provided training and programs for organizations of all shapes and sizes and worked with a diverse range of populations. This has given me front row seats for observing business operations, team dynamics, and individual responses, including tens of thousands of requests for help and offers of help in various forms. I identified patterns over time that are of particular value to nonprofit organizations and those trying to gather resources to make the world a better place. And I would like to share these insights with you so that you can benefit. If you take nothing else away from this video, this is the one concept I hope that sticks. When asking for help, treating your donors as members of a community rather than as individual units matters. You see, when organizations treat their donors as independent units, they find themselves devoting an incredible amount of their energy and resources into overcoming a perceived yes-no equation. Nonprofit organizations and the for-profit companies selling products and services to them to help with fundraising are convinced that when they ask people for help, those people will give only one of two answers, yes or no. This leads to purchasing fundraising tools and experimenting with fundraising techniques that will either increase the number of people who say yes or the percentage of people who say yes. On a side note, nonprofits are a huge source of revenue for the for profit sector. If you are a nonprofit organization, this is why you have so many companies trying to sell you things. How many catalogs did you receive this month? How many emails a week do you receive asking you for money? Building your nonprofit organization is many companies' for profit business. Do these products sound familiar? Pop up website plugins to grab people's emails phone and mailing lists for sale, web services to increase website traffic, search engine optimization services, web payment portals to ease donation with one click, sales training for your team, tools to make your events more engaging, promotional items you can give away so people remember you, and on and on. There are lots more beyond this list. With so many companies making sales pitches to nonprofits about why their tool or technique will increase the number or percentage of donors who respond, the concept that there is a yes no equation gets reinforced for nonprofits on a regular basis. And while all these tools can absolutely help you in the battle of the yes no equation, here is the reality there is no yes no equation. As a professional who builds support networks for a living, please believe me when I say that when you have a connection with someone and you ask them for help, their answer will always be yes. Why? Because this is the way that humans within communities and support networks naturally work. This is why the team building industry even exists, to help people find or create connections with others so that they can work better together, or in other words, so that they help each other. Grab a hold of this concept and run with it. Everyone in your donor community is open to helping you. In fact, there are six key resource categories that members of your donor community want to give to you from. Which category they give from will simply depend on who you are and what you are asking for at the time. If an organization has a connection with donors and they aren't receiving help from each member of that donor community when they ask for it, then chances are that the way they are asking for help is what is causing people to say no. And the most common explanation I see for the no response is that the organization is being too specific in their request and asking for a single resource from their donor community. Money, also known as funds. The following are the six key resource categories that your donor community wants to give to you from if you just ask. Purchase services and products, specific items, time, money, connections, and gratitude. It makes all the sense in the world that if you only ask for one resource, and nonprofits are usually primarily focused on money, then the members of your donor community who are interested in giving something else will say no. So here are two more big takeaways. First, when you have a connection with someone and ask them for help, their default response is yes. It's not a question of if they want to help, but how they want to help. Second, what help your connections provide will depend on who you are and what you are asking for at the time. 
Now, if you'll allow me to geek out for a moment, these next two observations made me lose my mind with excitement. Watching so many people ask for and offer help over the years revealed something fascinating. While we might lean towards giving from one or two categories more often, at some point in their lifetime, human beings give from each of the six key resource categories, and how we give complements each other. The result is that within a broader community context, everyone's needs have equal opportunity to be met. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say you are an organization that helps to reduce infant mortality through healthcare initiatives for families at risk. You approach 100 people in your donor community and ask for help from the six key resource categories. Here's the donor community's response. Everyone you have a connection with will say yes in some way and the kinds of help they provide from the six key resource categories are relatively evenly spread throughout the community. The way they provide you with help complements each other. Now let's say that on that same day, another organization that provides shelter for homeless and abused animals approaches those exact same 100 people who just happen to also belong to their donor community, asking for help from the six key resource categories. Here's the donor community's response. The kinds of help provided are still evenly spread out across the donor community, but how some of those donors have chosen to help has changed based on who is now standing in front of them and what they are asking for. This amazing human synergy is in a constant state of flux, and it's beautiful how these fluctuations all work together in harmony with each other. So your next big takeaway is this. Nonprofits are not in competition with each other for limited resources. There is an abundance of resources that donor communities are willing to share if asked, and the combination of differing missions combined with differing responses from donors means that everyone's needs have the opportunity to be met. Having said that, I've encountered people who have a hard time believing that this phenomenon exists because they know there's always that guy out there, the one who is so miserly he wouldn't give anything to save his life. All right then, let's factor him in. There he is. You still seem to be doing all right. Big takeaway number six is this. When you share all of your needs across the six key resource categories, you open up the possibility of receiving help from everyone in your donor community, which leads to big takeaway number seven. Never fundraise, always resource campaign. I think what I love most about resource campaigning and seeing donors as members of a larger community is the fact that it opens up the opportunity for your needs to be met in really creative ways. Camps who have a fundraising mentality and need new mattresses would be more likely to try and raise money to make the purchase or to focus on sharing a limited range of their needs, in this case the specific item of mattresses, which leads to common practices such as directly approaching a mattress company asking for donations, a request the mattress company is a little sick and tired of hearing from multiple nonprofits. They have a business to run and bills to pay. Camps who have a resource campaigning mentality would be more likely to share all of their current needs with their donor community and then step back to watch the human synergy at work. After making their appeal, the camp sees several of their needs addressed through increased revenue from purchased services, a new volunteer, a handful of financial donations, and receiving a fantastic response to their mattress registry. Having contacted a mattress company simply to learn if there are bulk discounts available for large purchases, the camp needs 200 mattresses after all. The company shares what their standard discount is. And because the camp respected that they are a business that needs to earn a living, they are grateful for the camp being a part of their community and decide they want to help where they can. As money starts coming in on the camp website from people who are buying mattresses by making donations for that very specific item, and a link on the camp website lets people buy the mattresses directly from the company, the mattress company quietly emails their customer mailing list telling their community about the campaign, and they encourage people to help the camp. The camp sees their needs met without ever knowing that 30 of the mattresses were purchased by the store's clients rather than their own donor community, and that a second volunteer, a high school student looking to complete volunteer hours for school, learned about the camp when the mattress company emailed their dad. The camp also ends up with a seriously fabulous connection. A member of their donor community has a cousin who works in mattress manufacturing. 
Sometimes mattresses have to be disposed of because a manufacturing flaw means it can't be sold, but is still perfectly good for sleeping on. The camp can now contact that person for any future mattress needs to see if any free ones are available. Seriously, resource campaigning is awesome. I would like to help you understand a bit more about putting a resource campaign into motion. First, you need to start with identifying what all of your needs are, and I mean all of your needs. Why would you bother leaving anything off the list? What a missed opportunity. Think big needs, small needs, and everything else in between. What are your wants? Who said you could only ask for mission critical items? Think about upcoming needs, plan ahead, and then start asking. For people to purchase your services and products, to help you gather specific items, to help you by donating their time and skill set, by donating money, by helping you make connections with specific people you're trying to find, and for people to enjoy what you are giving back to your community. To help you make the most of your appeals for each of these resources, let's learn a little bit more about the donors who give from each resource category. Purchase services and products. These relationships thrive when your organization says, this is what we have to offer and people can pay for it. These donors enjoy the reciprocal relationship of having given something and having received something of value in return. These donors get angry if simply asked for money with nothing offered in return. They want to know how you are earning your way and care deeply about fiscal responsibility. These donors love to support organizations through paying to rent space, equipment, or other resources from you, registering for workshops, retreats, or camp programs you offer, buying tickets or putting money in the hat for performances, speakers, presentations, or special events you organize, paying for professional services you offer, and paying for unique experiences you can offer them, such as restricted access, behind-the-scenes tours, and day-in-the-life of adventures. And this is just a short list. However many things you think you could offer to your donor community that they would be willing to pay for, you've got more. You just need to stop and think about it for a bit. Specific items. These relationships thrive when your organization shares a specific need and people can step up by purchasing the item, giving or lending from their own personal resources, or giving you the money to make the purchase. These relationships are deeply injured when a gift is not used in the manner they understood it would be, if a gift that is important to them is turned down, if an item lent to you is not cared for properly, or if asked for money without being given a clear account of how that money will be used. Heads up, this donor category comes with a serious learning curve and clear communication that is totally worth it. Don't steer clear of it because of the challenges. Embrace the challenges and enjoy the benefits. These donors love to support organizations through giving money for very specific needs. For example, identify the things you need to pay for and create a shopping portal on your website. These donors would never have given you $20 to support your mission, but they will happily give you $200 through your payment portal to purchase the specific item you said you need. These donors love to support organizations through purchasing the item for you. For example, create an Amazon wish list or registry through a major department store and share the link to it in your appeals. These donors love scrolling through the options and making purchases on your behalf. Amazon shows your mailing address at checkout and the goods can be delivered directly to you. If you use this tool, getting your mail deliveries is about to become a lot more exciting. These donors also love to support organizations through giving or loaning from their own resources. Sharing the full list of your current needs allows these donors to scan through and have moments of, oh, I have that, and get in touch with you. Time. These relationships thrive when your organization says it needs help and people have the opportunity to fulfill a specific role that has meaning to them. These relationships are deeply injured any time the donor is asked to give money to demonstrate true commitment or to show they have skin in the game. On a side note, as a team builder, I have never seen the phrase show you've got skin in the game do anything good for team or community dynamics. It has only done damage. Seriously, don't use it. Now your time donors love to support your organization through fulfilling roles that have meaning to them, and these roles can come in many shapes and sizes. Some time donors are interested in taking on advisory positions that allow them to share their expertise and insight into specific topics. These donors might be interested in serving as board members, 
as panelists for a professional development evening or providing consulting on a current topic of importance. They might be interested in taking on a structural role that allows them to help with the necessary administration needed to make achieving the mission possible. Do you need bookkeeping services? Event coordination, reception. Taking on volunteers to fulfill these roles takes strain off your budget and frees your staff to focus on other activities that further your goals. Your time donors may also be interested in taking on delivery roles that allow them to work at the ground level, making the mission happen. Do you need people to clear and wipe down tables at a soup kitchen, camp counselors, volunteers to walk dogs, or a bigger team to take on a large environmental cleanup project? There are people who are excited to get their hands dirty when it comes to your mission. On a side note, I find many organizations worry about placing important responsibilities in the hands of volunteers, but that is simply a reflection of a need for improved communication. It's okay to be upfront that you need great and not just good enough, and to be very clear about the qualifications or experience a volunteer needs to have before being brought on for a specific role. As your organization's communication improves, so will the quality of its volunteers as people are better able to find the roles that are the best fit for them. Whatever role your volunteers take on, and whatever amount of time they dedicate to you, please remember that every time donor sees incredible value in what they have to give because they are giving you time out of their margin. Here's what that means. A donor's time is filled with essential activities that are either non-negotiable, you have to sleep sometime, or that are critical high priorities such as family, work, school, caring for one's home, showers, doctor's appointments, and more. The time they have left over, their margin, is the time they have to donate from. You may have time donors who have no major commitments while others have barely an hour to themselves and yet they give that hour to you. Equally acknowledging gifts of time, big and small, rather than creating a hierarchy based on the amount of time given, is very important. Money. These relationships thrive when a person feels their money is providing benefit to someone, whether the organization, the recipient of the organization's efforts, or the donor themselves. For example, it makes the donor feel good, or they benefit at tax time from the charitable receipts. These relationships are deeply injured if you connect closely with the person for no other reason than to ask for money or by asking for money too often. These donors love to support organizations through giving funds, meaning money for generalized needs. If you say that their money will be used to stop world hunger, they believe you. Now stop and think about this for a moment. The reality is they have no idea if you will use that money to buy actual food, a plane ticket, pens for the office, or to pay someone's salary. But they trust that somehow you are using their money to accomplish what you said it would. If you really take time to reflect on that concept, that is a mind-boggling amount of trust. You asked for money to do something, the person believed you would do that, and gave you money. It's nice to have the flexibility to use funds any way you want, but if you always pay for things when the resources are out there just waiting for you to ask for them, then that money is not being well used. It's a wonder that nonprofits focus their energies so disproportionately on gathering this particular resource. Connections. These relationships thrive when a connector can say, I know just the person you're looking for and has an opportunity to put you in touch with them. These relationships are deeply injured when the connector is told you'd like to connect with anyone and everyone they know. This communicates to them, I don't care about you or the people you know, I just want your contact list. Connectors enjoy making specific connections that are beneficial to both parties and don't like having their connections taken advantage of for personal gain. These donors love to support organizations through making perfect connections and providing the necessary contact information or introductions. When connector mode kicks in, it's like interacting with a Google search engine. The more specific you can be about who you are looking for, the better the chances of getting a spot on response to your query. A lot of people think that using broad terms, asking for help connecting with others, will result in a bigger net that scoops up more people. Wrong. Asking to connect with more people is like telling Google that you are looking for something. Good luck with that. Specific parameters are what cause specific people to come to mind and lead to connectors taking action to make a connection happen. 
Here is an example. A bad request would sound something like, we are looking to connect with more schools who would be interested in hosting our Goodbye Bullying Youth Theatre Troupe. You can't connect with a school. It's a pile of bricks. You need to connect with people. So who are you looking for? Here is a more effectively worded request. We are looking to connect with people who have a deep interest in seeing bullying come to an end in their local schools and who would be interested in helping to arrange for our Goodbye Bullying Youth Theatre Troupe to provide presentations in those schools. On a side note, when you ask people to share your newsletter, Facebook post, or tweet with others, the people who respond are not your connections donors. They are your time donors. They are giving of their time to pass on a message because you asked them to. Connections donors kick into high gear when asked to share with people who would be interested. As a result, they will be much more specific and only pass information on to people they feel it's the right fit for so they can provide an introduction. They consider general sharing with everyone disrespectful of connections who would not be interested. Gratitude. These relationships thrive when your donor community sees that you value their contribution and give something valuable back. These relationships are deeply injured if the person receives a gift of crap or if it becomes clear that your organization only takes. Gratitude is definitely the least tangible of the six key resources, and it can be challenging to accept that it has equal value to other kinds of donations. I hope to put your mind at ease that to ask for people's gratitude by giving back to your community with no strings attached has immense benefits. Great things happen when organizations simply give for the joy of being a contributing member of general society and not just to the cause they have dedicated themselves to. When a donor receives a gift and goes into gratitude mode, they become willing to take care of needs an organization didn't even know they had. The result of their interaction with you is that they are thankful for you being who you are and doing what you do, and as a result, they want you to be seen in a positive light. They then go on to take action to support that outcome when the opportunity presents itself. For example, they may give directions to a family at the gas station who got lost while trying to find your facilities, remove graffiti from your sign before you even knew that you had been spray painted, or clean up garbage after your public event so that people won't see the trash and think poorly of you. The reality is that often you won't know when you've received a donation of gratitude, but your gratitude donors are out there, doing their thing, supporting you, and contributing to you achieving your mission. Because this resource is of equal importance to the others, I want to make sure you understand an interesting phenomenon that kicks in when a donor goes into gratitude mode. When a person enters gratitude mode, they are hyper aware of the give and take balance between what an organization is asking for from their donor community and what they are giving back. Gratitude donors respond positively to organizations that make contributions to their communities without asking for anything in return. These donors respond negatively to organizations they perceive as only asking or taking. I have found that a lot of nonprofit organizations are unaware that they simply take. They give to a very specific area of their world, so it feels like they are giving to the community, but their interactions with the general community are to ask for resources in order to continue giving to that one specific area. The general community is always being asked to give, which means the nonprofit organization is always asking to take. This is not a healthy flow of resources, and nonprofits end up wondering why people in their community start getting snippy with them. Nonprofits have to find ways to give back to their general communities, not just to the populations they are most passionate about serving. An animal shelter running a community dog show with the registration fees going to the shelter is still asking. An animal shelter that takes some of the animals to the local hospital to bring patients some joy without asking anything in return is giving. So please stop and ask yourself, do you give? Does your organization do something for the general community, not just the populations you are most passionate about serving, without asking for anything in return? Another gratitude phenomenon I want to make you aware of is the connection these donors make between the value of what you give them and how much you value them personally. The value of what you give to your community matters and has inherent messages built into the gift that you might not have intended. 
Common practices I come across that are utterly undermining nonprofits' relationships with their communities include giving people cheap promotional items such as pens, mugs, and fridge magnets with their logo on them, giving people cheap clothing with their logo on it, and printing certificates of recognition on common printer paper. Big takeaway number eight that I hope you run with from this presentation is that the value of the items you give to your donor community communicates how much you value them. This is because of something called facilitation, the art of creating an environment and an experience through which people will take away messages more powerful than any particular thing that you said or did. If you have interest in learning more about the art of facilitation, please contact me. Teaching people this skill set is something I am incredibly passionate about. Knowing how to facilitate is like having superpowers, and I would be more than happy to help show you how facilitation could be used to improve your experience with your donor community and the outcomes of your resource campaigns. To talk facilitation training, you can contact me directly at lindsay at opendoordevelopment.ca. Someone with a facilitator's eye will be able to pick up in short order when something your organization is giving away is sending the wrong message to your community. Not sure yet what those common practice gifts are communicating to your donor community if you are giving them away? Those cheap promotional knickknacks, cheap clothing items, and common printer paper certificates are considered by your gratitude donors to be crap, crap, crap and those donors equate how much you value them with those items you considered worthy gifts. How so many nonprofits fell into this destructive practice makes sense when we realize how often they are bombarded by the message, you need promotional items so that people will remember you and know how to contact you. But when we stop and think about where those messages are coming from, it's primarily from the companies selling the promotional items. That is hardly a neutral recommendation you're being given. Someone will financially benefit if you buy into the idea that a pen, water bottle, or mug will make you memorable. Big takeaway number nine is this. If you want to be remembered, be memorable. People will Google you if they want to reconnect or learn more. You do not want to be remembered because of a piece of junk or clutter with your contact information on it. When in doubt, have an awesome, high-quality business card and pro tip, use both sides to tell people more about you. That is really all you need. If you are going to give gifts to your community, ensure they are valuable and therefore communicate the message, we value you. Great gifts for your community include cash, event tickets, always give more than one ticket so they can go with a friend, large gift cards, $25 bare minimum, and believe me, that amount is scraping the bottom of the barrel. Higher amounts are better. Free services from your organization or thoughtful quality items such as a tablet, camping tent, or espresso machine. High quality plaques or quality frame certificates of recognition with all information checked for accuracy. That certificate becomes Instacrap if you spell the person's name wrong or get any of the details about why they're being recognized incorrect. And high quality clothing or accessories are great places to start. Are you planning on throwing an event for your donor community? Spoil them, serve them great food, have great music, create a great environment through careful choosing of your location or decor and don't charge a single penny to be there. In fact, tell people to bring a friend. Social anxiety stops a lot of people from attending, so make sure people feel safe with a known entity coming with them. And send people home with a quality gift or do a draw for something awesome if your resources would be spread too thin giving something to everyone. It's much better to do a draw for one person to win something awesome than to give everyone crap. Even if people don't win the draw, they still leave feeling valued because the organization was willing to give them something amazing. So what now? Well, here are some reflection questions to help you find ways to take action. First, what do you need? What do you want? And do you ask for all of your needs and wants from the six key resource categories to be met when you make appeals to your donor community? Now is the time to connect with your team and find out what all of the needs and wants are so that your appeals can really cover all the bases and light up opportunities for everyone in your donor community to respond. Next, are your fundraising campaign manager, volunteer coordinator, inventory manager, program director, communications director, and events coordinator all the same person or all working together as part of a close-knit team? If these individuals or roles are not currently united together, it's retreat time. 
Set aside time to really connect, to really get on the same page, to unify your visions and action plans so that everything you do works towards advancing a single comprehensive resource campaign. This will have much greater impact than any individual efforts to gather more funds, find more volunteers, find more registrants for events, or improve PR or supply chain procedures. Whether you are looking to make small adjustments to your approach or dive headfirst into a radical transformation of your campaigning efforts, the thing to remember is take action. Transition more and more from fundraising and focusing on gathering money to resource campaigning and gathering all of your needed resources. Don't just sit on this information. Look at how it could be actively applied to your context and continue to learn more so that you can find the resource campaigning principles and tools that will result in the greatest impact for your organization. Looking for additional resources to help you out? You can buy the book, Why Asking Donors for Money Causes Donors to Give Less, from the publisher at lulu.com. All of the information in this presentation is just scratching the surface of what there is to know about successful resource campaigning. The book has so much more to tell you. Grab a copy for yourself or multiple copies for your team so you can start a conversation. And pro tip, look at the publisher's main page before searching their catalog for this book. There are always e-codes that save you money when checking out. You can also book the author. I provide interactive presentations and team planning sessions to help explore how the principles could apply to your organization. To learn more, you can contact me directly at lindsay at opendoordevelopment.ca. You can find additional resources for your team at www.opendoordevelopment.ca, including training to help improve team dynamics and more support materials for this book. The site keeps growing, so check back regularly to see everything we have to offer. And if you're on Facebook, be sure to join the Resource Campaign Community Group to see what other people are doing within their organizations and to share what is working for you. The reality is that I'm excited for you, gathering all of this information together into a book and even sharing a portion of that information here with you now has been an incredibly rewarding experience for me because I know that as you apply these principles and enjoy the increased resources at your disposal, there's a very real ability to see your needs met beyond what you ever thought possible. Wishing you all the best and cheers.